everyone and welcome for our master class on digital transformation applied to logistics. Today, uh, we are talking to Wilson, Raisa and Alex from Visagio, and they will share the experience with us on this mystifying digital transformation to supply chain management and logistics professionals. If you can please show your hands so that I can be sure that you can hear me. Some of you, oh, there we go. Thank you, thank you so much. So you can hear us and that's fine. I hope if you are in a lockdown uh, as we are here in Perth, I, I hope you're doing fine. If you're not in a lockdown, I, I hope you're doing even finer than, than we are at this moment. And this is a great opportunity to, to learn more about those topics that are fundamental to us as supply chain professionals. And Wilson Reis and Alex will talk about the three key areas to help uh, you start your digital transformation journey. Looks like it is an unavoidable journey for us all, given all the advances that we have, all the technology. So how to start a conversation about digital transformation, how to explain digital transformation in a simplified framework, and some specific insights for supply chain management, logistics, and procurement. So this webinar is hosted by the Chapter WA. I am Flavio Macau, and I am the president of ASCII Chapter WA. And uh, a few more, uh, a little bit more of information as we move. Uh, so this is the welcome, and ASCII doing really hard to uh, bring to you uh, knowledge and information and practical, practical activities. And if you cannot keep up with us up to the end, or if you'd like to watch it again in the future, uh, we are recording this webinar and it will be posted on the ASCII YouTube channel. So if you're an ASCII member, you have access to that information. Maybe you want to share with your team. Maybe you want to, to go back to some specific point. The information will be there. And if you have registered on the ASCII website, this will be one CPD point awarded to you. If you have any questions, please send us an email and we will be happy to answer those questions to you. As you know, we are in an effort to uh, towards that registration pathway. So you can register to uh, ask it in different ways. Uh, this scheme started just a few months ago and you can come uh, as a registered associate and then move to a registered practitioner and then to a registered professional. And the rules are on the website and you provide the documentation, we make the assessment, and then you can add this extra to your career, to your profile, to your LinkedIn, and get access to a number of benefits that ASCII provide to the registered members. So yeah, uh, this reg registration, uh, it, you don't pay a fee if you start today. So because today is the last day of June and then there will be an application fee of $100 uh, coming the following days. So if you have some time today, gather some documentation, start your application because there is still time and you can see that the link here on the website. And it's about providing evidence that you are a supply chain logistics procurement professional. And as you get that evidence and send it to us, we will make that assessment to you. About the webinar today, so we will have Wilson, Harissa and Alex talking about these topics. At any time, uh, send your questions uh, in the chat or Q&A and we'll be happy to have this inter interactive uh, experience with you. Uh, and to the best of our abilities, to the best of their experience and abilities, to come with a good answer, proper answer to you. So without any further ado, I'd like to invite Wilson from Visage to start his presentation. I will stop sharing my screen and I'll let it up to you guys. There you go. So. Bizajo, if you can start sharing your screen, and Wilson, thank you so much for coming and starting the presentation. Thank you very much, Flavio. It's a, it's a very good pleasure to be here, so thanks for having us. 
So it's good to be talking with the community of the Australasian Supply Chain Institute. So I hope you guys can get something out of this today and learn some stuff. Uh, today we're gonna be talking uh, about digital transformation, right? So the presentation will be quite simple. So in the agenda, you can see that we're gonna go through a digital transformation methodology. Then we're gonna talk about a case study, which will give you, you know, the practical example uh, of these things. So there is a company presentation there in the agenda, but uh, today I will not bother you with that. So you're gonna have some uh, takeaways that you can take a look on that later on. So before I advance, so I just would like to start acknowledging that today today uh, is a is an interesting day. So across the country, we pretty much uh, in lockdown in many places and etc. Here we're meeting online, but I would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners owners of the lands that we meet. So acknowledge their elders, the past, present, and future. Here in Perth, where we are, that's the Wajak. Uh, nation of the Nunga people. Uh, so here we go, digital transformation. Uh, what are your expectations, right? So uh, we tend to do these sort of presentations more interactive today. I will, oh, by the way, that, uh, you know, this presentation is intended to go for roughly 30 minutes and we're gonna have Q and A later on. So if you do have questions, you feel free to send in the Q and A box there. And if we, if we can respond in, in between the presentation, okay. But anyway, so we're gonna have some time to do it later. Uh, every time that we start with the expectation, so we do what we call like a digital warm up. And what I mean by that is that digital transformation is such a big uh, subject that sometimes the expectations of what we're gonna show here goes, goes wild, right? So you could be thinking about, uh, you know, how you can digitize your processes. You could be thinking about, uh, you know, the use of technology, which is more like when we talk about digital transformation, we think about like the use of the technology. At the end of the day, we're gonna introduce you guys a more overall uh, uh, methodology about digital transformation. And we will ended up going to the technology, which is what people feel more comfortable with. So when we talk about digital transformation, I, I, what you normally do is step back and we talk about the core of transformation, transformation itself, right? Uh, just to set that scene where we really think about why we're talking about transformation. And we, 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 don't, we talk about transformation, business transformation and digital transformation for necessity, right? So uh, is, there are lots of researchers out there that say that you know, companies that don't innovate, don't transform, they ended up becoming obsolete. And that's uh, uh, vital for actually the, the survival of the companies. Every time that we talk about transformation itself, we're always looking at profitability, cash flow, longevity, and growth. Uh, we look at transformation in three universes the operational transformation universe. When we talk about operation transformation, it's all about the efficiency of assets, right? So how can you optimize your assets, your utilization, uh, so you can uh, perform better and 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 have a, you know as a, an impact, have an impact in the margin of your business and the cash generation. In the commercial transformation uh, universe, we focus more in the customer experience, and I I can even actually. Uh, extend that concept of customer experience, of you know, stakeholder experience. Sometimes in supply chain, we talk about inbound, inbound supply chain, which is, you know, is, not, is more the vendors that you deal with and the outbound supply chain where we actually liaise with the customer. So commercial transformation is all about improving that commercial experience. It's, it's focusing, you know, optimizing your channels and aiming at increasing uh, sales. Then we come to digital transformation. Digital transformation is a more, uh, what, as I mentioned before, we, we, we normally talk about technology, but I would like for you to, uh, to self-reflect on, on, on this definition here. When we talk about digital, we're talking about transforming the culture, the skills needed by the workforce, 
you know, uh, new business models, like, you know, new digital products, new uh, sales channels. Uh, so you can, you can actually uh, buy a digital help to transform your, uh, your business, right? So the way we do it, how we do it, uh, you know, so we, we use that sort of technology and people sort of analogy. So, you know, gonna develop those digital technologies and, and develop the organization, the people to be more uh, technology, to be more digital ready. Okay, when specifically about digital transformation, we use a simple framework to show what we mean by what I just uh, mentioned. Uh, we have this, uh, this model where, when we talk about digital transformation, talk about uh, a strategy and business models. So you really need to come back to what is the vision of the future for your business, right? So how, how do you differentiate yourself from the competitors, what the trends in the digital, what else can you add value to the, you know, to the customers and how the digital models uh, and physical models can coexist so we can, uh, have a, a you know as a, a, a business that's that's more modern. So then we go to the people and management model. So if you're going digital, so how going digital will impact your goals as a company, and how that will impact the culture of your company. How do you disseminate that culture of innovation, experimentation, agility? You know the client centrality. Those aspects of culture that are fundamental for, for, for digital uh, organization. And how you measure performance, how you track, you know, if you in the goal in, in, in the right way, you know, as you with your new uh, people uh, orientation, how you make sure that you can measure uh, properly. Then we have the operating model or operation model. This is really about uh, you know, putting the customer experience at the focus of it. So, you know, it, it, it really about your customer, really about your operation, your supply chain, marketing, commercial, uh, is really about being more efficient in those aspects, right? So if we're talking about your, your inbound supply chain and you have, you know, your relationships with your suppliers, how can you, uh, make use of a different business model for your interaction with your suppliers to be uh, more efficient. How can you use those digital technologies for you know, as a, in, improving transportation, improving you know, the, uh, your, your, your orders, you know, to make sure that you have a more timely, in a more timely fashion, you can do those, uh, those supply chain, the inbound supply chain processes. And, and in the outbound, uh, how can you relate better to the client? What are what are the channel the sales channels that you're using? So you have a physical shop. So are you online already? How you promote that sort of online sales channels? Uh, and let's not forget the internal processes as well. There's lots of things that you can automate in the internal processes to make sure that you, you you're more efficient. You do you you have a better you more you, you are more lean organization. In, you have a better processes in place. Uh, last but not least, we talk then about technology. Right? What are these technology architectures that will enable uh, you to be a more digital organization? Right? So let's go and take a quick look in each one of them. When we talk about a strategy, that's the conversation that every company uh, needs to have. Right? So whether you're going to be innovating in your core, which is in what you already doing, just doing in a different way, uh, just bringing digital to do better what you already do. When I talk about adjacent innovation, we talk about those complementary markets, new products and etc. So you're actually getting out of your core, out of you know that sort of comfort zone of the company and, and, and going into uh, uh, new products. And the transformation is when you create a new market or create a new business model altogether, right? So if we can think about those uh, those three, so if you if you have a manual process and you're just automating, so you're doing innovation at the core. If you have, you know, if you're using digital to now 
uh, selling the product that you already have, but uh, potentially to new markets using online sales, for instance. So you potentially actually open up new markets, complementary markets using the digital. That's uh, the, the adjacent innovation example. The transformational would be more, you know, if you look at uh, uh, the hotel industry and, you know, where you have the traditional, uh, the traditional uh, hotels and a physical asset sort of thing. And now you're going to that sort of Airbnb with, you know, with a technology facilitating a completely different business model where you don't have to have an individual asset where people go and stay, but now you can, you know, have a, a much bigger offer uh, of, uh, of accommodation enabled by technology, right? So <clears throat> there are several digital models you can use it, you know, you can think of. So it depends on your business you are. So if you are in a retail business and have that sort of, uh, you know, logistics as a core capability uh, uh, in your business. So, you know, can be talking, uh, you know, as about subscription models as, as, as a different way to sell products. Uh, you can be looking at a marketplace. So uh, uh, in, if, you, if you look at our, even if you look at our shops like uh, Nespresso, right? So you look at Nespresso that, you know, traditionally it would be just a retail shop selling coffee machines. And now this guy's going to a more subscription model where, where he creates sort of that lock-in with the client and, and uh, it start to operate in completely digi digital uh, fashion, I guess. So going on in the channel as well is another example is actually how you interact with your end user. So, you know, the traditional way of retail, you have your physical shops and you potentially have a, a call center, right? So now with all the, you know, social medias and, 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 and different opportunities for exploring other channels, you, you, you can be much more present. You can be in the face of your client the whole time, right? And so on, right? When we talk about people in management, uh, that's, you know, the cult cultural elements that you have to uh, talk about when you, uh, when you thinking about, uh, you know, your, your culture, then you have, you now have to have the culture of continuous learning, of trial and by trial, I mean like, you know, instead of extensive testing for new products, now you have a more trial and error sort of, uh, you know, it's an innovation sort of culture. So you need to be data driven, custom center, uh, much more you need to challenge those hierarchy or, or, or company governance models where it becomes too hard to innovate. Now that's you need to, to change now. The, the, what we call the transformation virtual cycle is that uh, cycle of culture, agility, innovation, you know, is new business models and, and results. As I mentioned before um, about the operating model, operating model is now, you know, when you put your customer as a center of, of everything that you're doing. So, and you can uh, consider mainly automation and customer centrality as something that will be core to what you do. So, and least but not last. So this is something that when we talk about digital people uh, uh, refer more to. So it's really the technology that we're gonna use uh, to enable those, you know, that transformation. We, uh, we mainly separate the technology application in four uh, streams. We talk about process automation. In process automation, we have things like, you know, the RPA, robotic process automation. Uh, applications implementation these days, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, lots of applications being launched every day. So the use of applications in a, in a software as a service model size is very, it, it, it put down barriers to adopt new applications. So uh, we would be, you know, looking at adopting those applications or, or, or developing our own applications there. Third one is the data and BI infrastructure. Data is pretty much uh, is, you know, the backbone of all this digital transformation. Uh, but we need to be aware that behind, behind the scenes, there is a, a, you know, is a, is a complex and intense need for a proper infrastructure for, for data. 
Uh, and the list again, not uh, last but not least, is the analytics and artificial intelligence. It's really, you know, the use of this data to to enable the decision making in the business, to enable, you know, to uh, to enable that process automation uh, in 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 a in a more efficient fashion. So analytics, you know, can start from a simple reporting or dashboard and go all the way to, to artificial intelligence optimization models where you're looking at predictive models and et cetera, right? So uh, that's, that's pretty much theory. So I won't hold you uh, to that uh, anymore or any longer. So I'll pass on to uh, Raisa and Alex so they can show you a real example of you know, applying this. Cool. Thanks, Wilson. Um, so I'm going to start off um, with just explaining a little bit of a journey that we went with um, the planning department, like the logistics planning department of a mining company here in Australia. So I want to take you through. So we've been working with them for a couple of years now, and we've been through many steps of this journey, like this theory that Wilson uh, took us through. Uh, but just to put in context, so the part of the like the part of the com of the company we're talking about so it's responsible for planning so it's a planning of um of the company the part of since capital prioritization to the monthly plan so they take care of all this part so we have the strategic planning but also they help understand what should be the best um decision uh to be applied like the best the next improvement to be done in the future and also establish the new plans, um, like the actual plan for the shorter horizons. Um, but this department in specifically, they wanted to do a bit more and than that. And actually they, try, they, they they define an objective of actually being the responsible for like supporting companies growth, the company growth plan, growth plan by providing insights to the business in a timely and reliable way. So you see how the objective there is really focused on the technology. Like when you think on timely, uh, reliable, this like you have to think of how you're going to empower that with your tool set. Um, so that's, and we went through a journey to get to that that we're going to take you guys through now. So everything started with um, the initial concept. So the, the department was founded and they started thinking on how can we do better analysis and we can provide better insights for the business. And in order to get that, they created like um, the idea of a simulation model. So the simulation model is in essence, uh, the name says it's like a, a, a programming, like a, 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 a solution in a computer. They can actually simulate everything that's happening in your supply chain. So it's often called like the digital twin. So the idea is that you can test different approaches, different methodologies, different like solutions for improvement in the supply chain in your computer before actually implementing that in real life. Right, so this was the core of how everything started. And a few years back, it started with just what would, we would call a black box simulation because it was um, a program provided by an external provider. Um, it was hard to make improvements to it. Like we would we would be like highly dependent on on people to like, and it was not very specific to the needs of the company. Uh, so this was when when they had like the big shift. Um, they say, okay, maybe if we wanna move on to something more robust, something more specific, we should like take a next step. So that's why that's when they move on to a next step in their journey, which is actually kick off a project to actually do a simulation in-house. So they still kept, so on, when Wilson mentioned about the horizon, so you can actually be thinking of innovation in the three different horizons. So you can still be improving your core. So for example, they, you still need to focus on keep delivering what you have. Like they already had clients back then. So their clients are in the company itself, right? Their service providers for the company. So they already had clients, they still, had to maintain a high service uh, level. So they, they were still providing support for them. But at the same time, they developed a whole new cell inside the department to actually prepare for this new era, let's say this, where they would be building the new things um, themselves. And for that, there was uh, all the aspects that Wilson mentioned had to be in place. So 
we had like the people in management model. So we need to think, okay, what sort of people do we need to accomplish this, right? Before maybe we had a lot more analysts, a lot more like SMEs in certain knowledge like in supply chain, but now we actually need to bring more data scientists. We need to bring people who like programmers, people who know how to like deal with this sort of technology. So it's the whole sort of mindset. And then the operating model as well. So I mentioned about keep delivering the current projects, but then how are we gonna maintain that in the future? Because the technology has to evolve and has to be maintained. It's not something that you're gonna implement and leave. Like how, do we, how do we prepare ourselves for the future? So always thinking ahead on that. And the technology has been the foundation, right? So the, the technology is the last, but it's actually the foundation for everything, which is the actual model itself. So this all started and the discussions and everything that was growing after this uh, that we're going to talk about. I think um, at this point, it's important to circle back to something that Wilson had said um, at the very beginning when he was defining um, digital transformation. So digital transformation, there's, there's a common um, habit of us to think about it in like translating into new technology exclusively, but it's not necessarily that. So as he was explaining, as, as Haisa as it was explaining as well, there are cultural and strategic factors that drive you to what technology do you even have to use in the first place, right? And the migration from a black box simulation, which was a third party, well, a third party solution being provided to us to something that would be developed in-house was actually quite a big landmark to what we were doing in terms of strategy in the business, right? Because that by, 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 you know, acquiring the capacities of being able to develop a simulation model in-house, that would change fundamental things like how do we hire people? What specialization are we looking for? And even on the org structure, how are teams going to be structured to be able to cooperate together? Because one of the main challenges that you would face on trying to migrate from a black box solution to a in-house solution is that while this was being developed because the scope was quite ambitious so while was this being while this was being developed you would still have to deliver uh, your results and your analysis and your simulations by utilizing what was there before so managing that pipeline and making sure you have something that is sustainable was very um, important at this stage uh, but there were um, Almost, uh, almost like chain reaction events that came from this expansion in capacity. So we have reshaped and we have changed the way we hire and the way we train and the way we, we, we give people roles within the team to do the in-house simulation. But with those set of skills, we have actually opened ourselves doors and opportunities to be developing way more than just our simulation model. So um, I'm going to talk about three of these aspects in particular, and the very first one is the data management platform. So with uh, simulation being the core of what this department would do, it's uh, easy to imagine how you would uh, utilize a lot of data to be able to set up this properly, and, and you will also generate a lot of data as the output of this simulation. So having a sustainable and reliable data management platform was crucial at this point in time. And because we have been growing and maturing to in terms of our skills, we were now no longer only a team that knew how to utilize technology. We were a team that knew how to create technology as well. And this is what we were going for this. So making sure that because data is at the center of decision-making, we would have the capacities of take care of our data, manipulate our data, treat and store and publish this in a way that is uh, in the same pace as the business would grow and the demands would grow with it. Um, but data itself is not uh, only what you can progress on. So even though we had our data situation going in a very good direction, there was uh, still a lot of analysis and a lot of data crunching and a lot of insights that the, that the team would need to drive. So this is where the applications were really fundamental in the, in the, in the pursuit of transformation on the things that we do. Um, it's because before we went for the web applications as, as one of our strategy guidances, um, the team was very much reliant on using spreadsheets or custom uh, methods of their own to be able to work the data and to be able to drive the insights. So web applications was a measure 
that, that the team has put in place to make sure that not only we had control over the requirements, but that we had um, a, a way of streamlining what are the common tools and instruments that would be available from that point onwards for the team to be able to work with. Um, and the reason why this is so useful compared to what we have before is because when you centralize a web app, when you, when you streamline your team into using the same thing, you are also facilitating the distribution of improvements and fixes and the evolution uh, of what that department is going to be doing uh, as its core operation, as its acting methodology. Uh, but only the web applications and the data management platform were still not enough. So we were always eager to drive change and to make our team more efficient uh, because we were developing so much, because we were so concentrated into creating technology. It was, uh, it, was, it was a challenge that we had that like the solutions and the tools and the data spaces that we would develop were not necessarily um, growing at the same pace as our headcount. And if you think about it, the idea is not that you keep increasing headcount, right? The idea is for you to go for performance, for cost reduction, for you to have an optimized team that is focused on driving innovation, on doing actual intelligent work in this, instead of, um, let's say, being overwhelmed by business as usual activities and mechanical tasks and all of that. So the process automation was the third end of this uh, triangle. So the process automation makes sure that the entire life cycle from the moment we utilize and, and generate data to the, to the reports that we would use, to the form that we would visualize and publish and even utilize this data, all that life cycle was automated, making sure uh, that, that we would be able to be sustainable in the way uh, that we do our solutions, right? So uh, this was uh, fundamental for us to shape a team that would, again, drive more innovation instead of just drive more operation. Um. Cool. And I think, um, so yeah, this was the, these were the main steps that we went through. Uh, but I think it's important to highlight that this is laid out as a line here as like a, a, a straight timeline, but it, it didn't actually happen like that. We had like that improvements along the way. We had web applications that were happening along the way. So this was just us trying to bucket that out and seeing that in the end, everything will become one single toolkit, but you may be wondering, right? Okay, so you've done all this work, you've done spent all this time doing all these new, new features, but what, what's the actually impact? Like, so what? Like, what actually happened? So it's actually a very cool achievement that uh, with this model that was built and the whole structure around it, we actually are able to identify, uh, we've, we do an average every year, like try to make like a, looking back of all the projects that we've been through that we can actually identify between five and 10 billion tons per annum in saving of initiatives. So the initiatives can go from identifying like replicating a new asset, so like, uh, like simulating a new asset that's gonna be introduced to the supply chain, but also like helping with like alignment of maintenance, better utilization of equipment. So many parts of the supply chain could be simulated there, which brings a lot of value to the business. So this whole, transformation actually allowed that um, in, the, in the long term. So, but this was only enabled not only by the environment that we built of tools, but of the culture we've built around. So I think if there's one message we wanna get across uh, today is that not always like the technology is not the, the core of this, the technology is the enabler but the team and the culture has to be the main driver, right? So for example, when you have that culture of innovation, the, the circle of transformation, that's when you get, that's when you see change, right? So when you get like the culture of a team that's constantly evolving, you have that innovation mindset, that's when you actually gonna be looking for new solutions. You're gonna be thinking outside of the box and you're gonna be um, doing, like, doing quick wins, doing things that are gonna add value to the business. Um, so I think this was a very major I am a very important part of what we're doing, uh, as well as like the data-driven decisions. So Alex mentioned a lot about this and I think that's the core nowadays. So we have a lot of data and we need to base our decisions in data, right? Rather than just um, some thoughts and some things that we, we may have in our head. Like, of course, that's very important. That's very valuable. But when we can actually prove our analysis based on data, that's actually, that's a win. Uh, and around that, we also have like, we didn't comment, like briefly comment about that, but we have actually a very big 
uh, development support structure, which is, like I said, when I was saying it, when I was, uh, I was going through the beginning, uh, when we first started thinking of that, we need to think ahead, how we are gonna maintain the solutions in the future, right? Because technology keeps evolving, um, the solution, like the needs from the people using it keeps changing. So we need to have a good structure of maintenance afterwards as well. So we have embedded in this team a development and operations um, support, which is like people responsible for constantly uh, making improvements, revising, testing, um, monitoring everything that's going on, which is really crucial for everything to run smoothly. And I think the last message we want to get across is that, for example, the image uh, we're showing there, it's like the whole tool set that we have so far that we have nowadays. We can see there's a lot of different technologies, maybe icons and names that we have never seen. But the message here is that, that actually it's not the important part, right? The technology is the enabler. We want to digitalize things. We want to have things more automated, that's for sure. But sometimes people get to hook on what's the best technology or should I use the state of the art? Should I use this next AI thing that's coming up? But sometimes not, sometimes you're not ready for that. Sometimes you need to build your foundation first. Sometimes you, it's gonna be better to use something that's simpler for then increase. So sometimes trying to just go full on with what's, whatever is the biggest trend in the market will actually uh, knock you down. So try like to think of baby steps, but I think the message is that you always have to be looking ahead and seeing the, like, always having a goal, a direction, and the technology is the enabler for you here. And I think in terms of timeline, we have like a, an arrow going there. So I think uh, this is the case and the things we've done so far, but there's a lot more to be done. Like, as I said, con technology is constantly evolving. And, and I think that's most of the message we want to pass on today. I think you just, uh, just one comment I would add. Um, to that, how he says, um, like we said before, it's it's amazing how when you're moving into the right direction, some of these progresses, some of these evolution, uh, it, it happens as a chain reaction of other things you can't always predict. Um, and the thing is, by automating processes, by creating new instruments, or by working how you utilize the data that is even driving your your decisions in the first place, all of these things they correlate with each other, even if you didn't originally plan for it. In, in manners that it, it forces you to, re, to do the exercise of looking at what you have and criticizing what you have and challenging whether you're evolving at the pace of your demands and everything like that. So uh, it's no coincidence that, for example, some specific circles in that technology graph over there are connecting to, multi to multiple green circles. It's simply because all of these things, they, they sort of work in cooperation, right? And this is how, uh, and this is how, um, disruptive, I guess, the transformation aspect of it all is. It's just, it's just that explosive effect of um, chain reaction. Um, Will, do you want to say a few words in terms of the wrap up? I think, uh, I think we have an opportunity now to, uh, to look at the questions and what people think and maybe make that more interactive. Thank you. Thank you so much. That, that's, that's fantastic, actually. And we have some questions popping up. So thank you for your participation. Some really good knowledge that we got. And I'll kick off with a question from Elizabeth. And what is Elizabeth is asking, I, I shared uh, that we had a, a similar conversation at our company just the other day. We had this big strategic meeting. And at one point in the meeting, we had one of our VPs talking about automation. Automation is coming. And it was like an earthquake. Some people are kind of freaking out. So what do you, Bizajo, what are your thoughts on the development of current operational people in new digital environments? Alternatively, do you just hand over the digital team who uh, under, uh, understand the software better than operations? So, so how do you manage this, uh, the software people, the, 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 the people that are, are used to the operation, how they talk to each other, and how do you deal with this digital transformation from a people's perspective when automation is coming? 
So thanks for that question. That's a pretty good one. So uh, look, there are so many components in these. So when we, when we talk, when we talk group, uh, overall as transformation and say that people and culture is a big chunk of it, uh, we actually, I don't think actually we did, uh, we will find this presentation to, to show the relevance of that. So let me try to break that down, right? So there is one thing which is a, a continuous you know, professional development upskill and reskill uh, need, right? That, that's across the workforce. So uh, digital technologies and, and, and the new way of doing things uh, is here, is here to stay. You know, your, your organizations will transform whether you resist or not. So, and the need for people to be reskilled and or learning new capabilities uh, is there. So that, that, that's one thing. So when we talk about digital in particular, it's very interesting that, uh, you know, as a Flavio, you know, you as part of a university and there is a big trend these days in education of something called uh, like a, a, a business analytics, right? So what is business analytics? Business analytics is, 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 is a new trend, is an area of knowledge which join what would be a, a, a data analytics sort of group, some more computer science developers and more STEM oriented sort of professionals. And then the operations business professionals that know actually what you do at, you know, as a company. So the business analytics is a kind of, uh, you know, sits in the middle, which is the people with, uh, you know, as a, is a business savvy, but people also digital savvy to try to create that new capability where you're able to talk the two languages. That's, uh, it's not completely new, but it's a new area of work, whether you are operational person and you get yourself more digitally savvy, it doesn't mean that you need to not now do coding, but, 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 there's, but you know, the, the guys doing coding also need that sort of business knowledge. So you can meet in the midterm. So if you're able to do a transition to that sort of uh, uh, profession, that's a way forward for an operational person. And by the way, this is just one example, right? So uh, the people need to look at, you, know, you really need, the operational people need to look at these opportunities to, you know, what, what, what are you gonna do next? I think a key message is, uh, well, look, if you try to resist to the changes that are happening and you insist and actually do, keep doing the same thing and not uh, upskilling yourself. So I'm, I'm not too optimistic. So if you have that sort of uh, uh, positioning, right? So I think everyone should look at how can you develop yourself, in, including the operational guys. Yep. I, yep. If most, I can add a comment to that, uh, sorry, Flavio. <laughs> No, I, I was just going to say, if I can add a comment to that from, from a more um, specific example, I guess, is if, if you're focusing, let's say, on process automation exactly, right? So usually what happens is that it's not about, it's not about separation between the software development side of things and, or the process automation side of things and the business logic and operation teams. It's actually about cooperation of those two. And the way that, you, that you're going to handle it, it pretty much differs on the type of business, but it's important, for example, it's a, it's a fundamental step for everything that is about to be automated, that every single step of your process can be translated into a logical step. If there's not a logical step, it's unlikely you'll be able to fully automate it. You will be error prone. There will be a lot of risk in automating something that is not set, uh, not necessarily set in stone, but declared logically like that. So this right there, it's the very first exercise, right? Is when the teams, the, the, the business teams and the, the development teams get together to understand what we have today, is it, is it really ready to have a, a technological intervention? Because if it's not, maybe the very first step is for us to sit down and just work it out. What can we do to improve? What can we do to make this process a little bit leaner um, and all of that? If you want to have a dedicated team to doing that it's or, or, or having a technology, a technology asset embedded into the teams to learn all that part. You can do it in both ways. It's all about what your business can support and what makes more sense um, for your context. Yeah. 
Yeah, that, that's a very important question that people have to ask as they um, go into this journey really good. And the questions are popping. I, I have one here from Scott. Scott's playing the devil's advocate, which is fantastic. So, okay, <clears throat> digital it is, digital transformation, but how is this different from just taking technology development in house use some sensible tech to build user-friendly tools and solutions, then change management to foster leverage these tools. So is digital not just the pendulum swinging from off the shelf back to in-house with good change management? Isn't this digital thing uh, kind of something that we have seen before? I love the question. So, uh, well, look, uh, uh, I jump in the, the, the cynical part of the question whether, well, this is not new, right? So we, 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 we have been doing that for quite a while. And uh, Scott, wasn't it, Flavio? So Scott, I think you're quite right. So implementing new technologies and you know trying to improve in processes, not new at all. So we haven't been doing that for decades. There are a few things though that are new, right? So. Uh, there are things like, uh, you know, the, the, the pace of the change, the pace of the change is quite new. So, uh, you know, it's uh, two decades ago. So, uh, you know, uh, how you increase your uh, technology in terms of the capability of the technology. So it's completely different, right? So we talk about storage of data. We talk about computer speed, things that actually enable much more significant changes. So what happened before is that uh, the speed of change in technology groups, when companies have the technology departments and the business departments, and in the past, so the time frames of those changes were like you know, years for, for a big system to be implemented. So whether now you can't afford that, so you don't have any more years to make that change. Your organization change every six months. So how can you have a technology being done every three years. So when we use a, a more new fashion terminology like digital transformation, we also mean that agility is a big part of it. And I can even uh, uh, talk about the, the last question in this context as well, because before we have those silos of people that do technology, people that do business. Now we have this thing, now you can almost the technology department uh, in my in my view, is actually gains a completely new format. It embeds into the organization, into the business departments, so you can do that in a more agile fashion. At the end of the day, yes, you're right. So it's not completely different, but the way, the pace of change, the way you do change management, the the, the actors, the role of the actors in those projects uh, are, are new. Fantastic. And I, I will quick fire a few questions because they keep on popping. We have this one from Joshua. So Joshua asks, so you mentioned that the department you work in operated as a service provider to the rest of the company. So how did you manage client demands with the internal work that is required to transform the department into a more efficient and valuable service? Quick fire for this one. I think I can take this one. So I think uh, client is the main reason why we would exist as a, as a like the department, right? It's an internal provider. So the priority is to keep delivering the core, right? To keep improving and delivering uh, what we do, what we have at the moment, and my like, adding value to the business. And I think it 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 just it gets on a wheel, right? Because you you actually deliver more value. You're gonna have more clients, and then it becomes more evident how we actually need to improve and spend more time and effort on that. So I think it, it would, it did impact. Like that's why when I said about people at the beginning, I, I, I mentioned actually bringing more people. So it actually meant having people dedicated to actually do this part of the improvement and also having people focus on the core. So in the end, they all merged to the same team, but it was good to have this clear split as well. So you don't get People who are actually helping, thinking on the on the next, not so hooked up on the on the BAU part of things. Uh, but I think it comes down to really adding value and keep adding value to what you already do. So then you demonstrate that you actually can improve 
and and spend more time on that in the future to make it even better. Um, I think just one thing to add to that as well is in 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 regards of prioritization, right? If you have a lot coming through, um, the main driver of your prioritization is always going to be the business direction, right? So what we're talking about here is a, is a supply chain, and the supply chain will have a strategy for improvement, and that improvement may focus on specific aspects or on on particular sections of it. I think the very first level of assessment when prioritizing work coming through in this scenario would be whether that request is aligned to the business direction. And that if it is, it almost as if it almost gets transferred to like a second queue sort of structure. And from that on, uh, we, we would do uh, several, others, several other exercises of assessment. Yeah. Okay, great, great one. And now we move to a question from Vijay, which is a very specific question. And I like that because it goes to the core of the things that we do. So on your last slide, you had multiple softwares that are integrated to the perform the, the automation. I'm assuming it was chosen uh, such that CapEx or capital budget reduction was the end goal. Can you please advise the impacts in OPEX in terms of ongoing costs associated with it? I'm not asking for exact number. You can provide indicative percentage with reference to CapEx. So uh, uh, summarizing the question, the impacts on CapEx, OPEX, how that work on that project, what you can say about it? So thanks for the question, uh, Vijay. So uh, look, there, there, is, there, there, need, there is a need to be a financial model for every initiative that's being done, right? So you have, you have different things. So you have the, the transformation that the project, the, the transformation that the department went through, which requires a, a, a big capex with you know, the new technology, new, uh, you know, new ways of operating, etc. And that follows a more traditional um, model of return of investment. So, you know, at the end of the day, this all exists because of the business and results that you can achieve with it. So we have a whole lot of, uh, you know, uh, gains or results that, you know, came from this digital capability in this, in the supply chain uh, planning scheduling department. So, and that's respond to the CapEx because we have the traditional return of investment there. So in terms of the OPEX, uh, so if you, if, you, if you compare to the OPEX of your technology department in the past, uh, it doesn't differ much. So what you, what you have in the business now is more like a, a reorganization where the, the operational uh, cost design, it, it is not all embedded in the technology team, but is embedded in some of the business areas as well. Uh, I don't, I, I don't have exact numbers to share. So, uh, I, and I'm happy to look at percentages more, more specifically, and maybe share later on VJ. So it's a number that I don't have. Yeah, I think the message there is definitely bring your finance people to your supply chain logistics and procurement projects because they are definitely mm -hmm. important on those considerations. And then we move to a, another question now from Tom. And Tom, I totally share uh, your worries on this question. So can you please comment on how you manage data integrity and data security across multiple systems and business process as part of your digital transformation? This is a big headline. How do you do it? Yeah, so I think, sorry, you wanna go some? <laughs> you, can, you can start off, I'll jump in. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say that I think um, data security, I think it's actually a very critical matter, a critical matter. And I think we have like a whole department in this company just focus on that. And I think we often, although we're bringing the technologies to the business, I think these are parts of that are managing a little, manage a little bit outside. I can talk a lot about data integrity. So we have many things in place to make sure the data we are using is the right data and we do automated checks. So I think that's where the automation comes in quite a lot. So we have like systems health checks and we have dashboards and we have, yeah, I think automated validations and things to identify if there is any issues with the data. So we are even in a process of like adding more AI 
to like actually having like understanding the context of the data as well. So not only if it's negative, so you can you can put a few things in place to actually identify issues with your data. They are more structured, but you can ask also like think of even other ways that these are more automated and it, it learns with itself, right? So we can do like AI to improve this, as in the uh, yeah the AI would get the context of the data and understand when when is the issue. So I think. This is a major part of what we did there. And I think it was one of the main reasons why we did that data management system in the first place, because we weren't so comfortable with the data that was given us. So this data management platform that we built actually does a lot of treatment of the data as well to fit, um, to adapt and like the way we need it. Yeah. So I think you want to compliment. Um... Yes, I was just going to say the model that we tend to work with in, in regards of data storage and access is via a data warehouse. And then between the data warehouse, in a simplified view, you can imagine all your core systems feeding you the raw data. All of that gets dumped into a staging um, space. And then from that staging space, you go through several steps of treatment and grouping and shaping and transforming until you get to what your business logic needs to uh, apply for context. And then from that, you, you then land up on what we call the data warehouse. So when we are performing analysis, when we are doing work, when we are uh, driving decisions from these numbers, we make sure we are already reading from a stage where data has been treated. So we never, as a, as a method, we never necessarily go to the raw data or to the, to the pure system data um, for insight. But I think not only that, right? So the the, the, the way we do to actually make sure that this stays relevant. So one example uh, that I can give a, a very real example from this case is that we have a simulation model, right? So every now and then, let's say when you close a financial year or when you close a full year or something like that, it's important for you to see if that model um, is still working as expected. So we do have, for example, as a part of data validation and, and data integrity uh, exercise, we do have a process of validation where um, we run the simulation for an entire year. And then we compare the results of that simulation to what actually happened uh, on the supply chain on that same period that year as well. And already by looking at that, we can identify some of the things that we have to improve here and there, some data treatments that are not showing the accuracy that we are looking for and all of that. So um, it's actually, it's actually I, I think it, we, it, it's come to a point where it's just impossible to list all the things that we that we put in place to ensure data integrity, but it's just, uh, it's just, it's just, it's not something that is there and we trust that it, it's just something that is there, but we're also vigilant about reviewing it at every turn. Totally, that, that's so important. And most definitely we, we have many more questions than we have time to answer those questions at this moment. And, and I hope we can keep on with the conversation on the ASCII LinkedIn webpage. Uh, I would like to finish with one question and this question, I, very quick answer from Kazun. So can you share with us critical incidents, breakdowns, failures, but I'll focus on this one so that we close this webinar today. Lessons learned from the case study. Few words, can you close with that, please? I think, yeah, sorry, you're going well. <laughs> To me, the, the, the easy, like the, the, the main one is like, just try and like fail fast. So I think that's the main message is like, just go and do, like if you have an idea in mind, you work on it and you, even if it's like a proof of concept. So most of the things that we've said today started as a proof of concept at something that maybe wasn't the ideal future scenario. Uh, and we build to it. So you, you build a proof of concept, you do something that's fast, you add value, and then if it, if it actually added value, then you can put more effort and build something more sustainable. So I think that's the main lesson, lesson learned that I... So I think on top of that, so if, you mention, if you're talking about critical incidents and breakdowns, failures in, in operations, so one of the things that, uh, that were quite nice to see was that the you know the organization had a different department looking about looking uh, looking after the deviation management situations uh, and in several occasions this digital team that was creating supply chain management able to study 
and quickly turn around some sort of insights for that team to be able to respond to the incidents. So in that sense, uh, the lesson learned is more like the, uh, the, the, there is now a new capability that wasn't there before that you, you know, the operation can make use of. And, and we need to be even more agile to be able to respond to those. Fantastic. And we are right on time. So thank you so much, Alex, Reis, and Wilson. People, if you can show your hands to our, our panelists. Thank you so much for being here today. Let's continue this conversation. Let's continue talking to Visajan and Aski. And I hope you have a great day. See you around. Thank you, Flavio. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Flavio. Mm-hmm.